Good evening, everybody. Well, good evening. I should also say good morning because we actually have guests from all around the world here today. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this event. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Professor Jane Falkingham, and I have the real honour at the moment to be the Vice President at the University of Southampton, responsible for our engagement and international activities. And on the eve of International Women's Day, it's a day we celebrate the achievements of women around the globe. So I'm really delighted to be your host this evening. We have friends, staff, students, alumni and supporters from all around the world joining us tonight. This is our third International Women's Day event, building on the excess, success of our inaugural event in 2022. This year, International Women's Day 2024 campaign is Let's Inspire Inclusion. And I'm really delighted, as well as being the Vice President for Engagement in International, I also hold the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion brief for the university. And the university is really setting out some fantastic initiatives to ensure that women are treated equally and are supported to succeed. Earlier in the year, I was on a round table actually with um, Justin Greening and uh, Mim Davis, and I was back in Downing Street yesterday for a round table on the menopause. And it's really fantastic to see that we're thinking about initiatives to in ensure women are treated equally right across the life course, from young women starting out to older women actually being supported to stay in the workforce. So tonight's event will run until about 6.50. And within the next 50 minutes, our guest, the Right Honourable Justin Greening, and I will explore her professional journey so far followed by you, wherever you are, having the opportunity to post any questions or clarifications you'd like Justin to respond to. You'll find the question and answer box on the right hand side of your screen. Please add your questions throughout the event and make sure you vote for your favourite questions as the most popular questions will be given priority. So Justin, please join us. It's now my absolute pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker, the Right Honourable Justin Greening. Since graduating from Southampton in 1990 with a first class honours degree in business economics and accounting, Justin has become a household name as an MP, tackling some of the biggest projects and challenges facing society. Justin was the Secretary of State for Education from 2016 to 2018. And prior to that, she served as Economic Secretary to the Treasury from 2010 to 2011, Secretary of State for Transport from 2011 to 2012, and Secretary of State for International Development from 2012 to 2016. And as a member of the Conservative Party, she was a Member of Parliament for Putney from, from uh, 2005 to 2019. So since leaving Parliament, Justine has campaigned for social mobility and equality of opportunity. She hosts the Fit for Purpose podcast, which aims to explore how business is working to level up Britain. And we're also delighted that Justine received an honorary degree from us last year. So good evening, Justine. It's so good to be talking with you this evening. Can I start by thanking you for joining us? And I'm sure the audience would love to hear a little bit more about your time in Southampton. So maybe we could start there. You talked before about your time at the university being transformative. Could you tell us a little bit about how your experiences at Southampton have set you on your current path? Well, <coughs> thanks, thanks for that introduction. And um, I mean, it's brilliant to be able to join everyone this evening, um, especially with Southampton University, obviously, as you say, Jane, where it really transformed my prospects. And um, I think when I arrived, uh, by the time I left, I was a very different person to when I arrived. And Southampton was in a very different part of the country than where I'd grown up, which is up in the north. And so it was a really brave new world when my parents dropped me off. Um, but I, I love being at the university. I think I met a lot of very different people. It's the first time I'd met people who were privately educated. Um, I didn't really get into politics whilst I was at university. I was far too busy, I think, socialising at the student union, playing squash, serving the odd beer behind the bar at Glen Eyre, for any of you who know, know that, all the residents, which is where I was. Um, so now I had a fantastic time. And, you know, one of the 
best bits of doing my social mobility work now is the fact that I've been able to you know get back to Southampton and and if you like join up the dots on that social mobility journey I've been on with what I'm now trying to achieve for a, a wider a wider country really. So Justin thank you for that um you're very well known in politics and economics and for social mobility as you've already mentioned and, and going through your career would take hours to recount um, so whilst it would be it's difficult to narrow down to a few highlights, could you talk a, a little bit about what you're most proud of to date? Well, I think I mean, I think in terms of roles in cabinet, um, you mentioned I was transport secretary doing the Olympics back in 2012 was a white knuckle ride. But um, I was so proud of what the teams did that I worked with, whether it was here in London, where I'm sat now or or really any of those venues. That was just an incredible project to, to play a role in. Um, I think for development, um, I mean, I was very involved in shaping the SDGs and it's where I really got chance to try and do my best impact for Britain on gender. We really um, campaigned on getting Gender Goal 5, um, a central part of the Sustainable Development Goals. And I think in education, the, the final role in Cabinet that I had I mean, really, it allowed me to bring all of that that knowledge and, if you like, that that passion together, um, which was to work on this even broader topic of social mobility, which wasn't just about um, girls doing well, but was really looking at disadvantage um, in many respects and, and how we could close the gap. So I loved every moment, Jane, and I think I was incredibly lucky to do all of those roles and uh, threw myself into them. Yeah, well, just so we could talk about all those roles. They all sound amazing. But as you know, I'm a professor of demography as well. So mm -hmm. um, I'm really struck by your work on SDG 5. Mm. You know, to be on a UN panel working to improve women's empowerment. Tell us a little bit more about that. And, and do you, what's your reflections on, on how far we've come? What have we achieved? now several years on i think it's a really good question and, and for the sdgs um when we were first starting to think at the un level about what's next that was probably about 2013 um the millennium development goals were coming to an end we needed to work out what was what was coming next and as you can imagine you know with something like 160 countries at the un um trying to get all of them corralled around one set of goals was really, really challenging. And so I think from a UK perspective, we decided to really focus on gender because our view, my view is I don't think any country develops if half the population is locked out. I think it's a really fundamental point of development. It should be equitable and it absolutely should include um, all women. And so we decided we would really try and take that original Millennium Development Goal, but build it out to be much more powerful, more specific. Mm -hmm. um, in our case, we wanted to include things like um, combating FGM. And, and so we really focused our, our work on that. But I think after we'd managed to succeed with others, you know, it was a collaborative effect. Um, to get Gender Goal 5 in there, we really then asked ourselves, well, what, what can we do next? What's the next thing that we can do that will really make a massive difference? And it was this point about making sure we had impact. And so we we really sort of said, well, actually, the best thing we could have is the UN high level panel specifically looking mm -hmm. at how we're going to make sure Gender Goal 5 happens and particularly the economic piece of it. So. I remember going to see Ban Ki-moon, who was the Secretary General at the time, you know, uh -huh. even if you're a, a UK development secretary, um, he's a busy man. <laughs> That's a lot of countries. So we, we, we got this half an hour with him and I remember pitching to him and in advance various officials saying this is what Justine wants to talk to, to Ban about. And um, I just remember him being incredibly uh, positive about it and, and I, I said to him I know you'll have a lot of people who always want a panel on their their thing but this is I think this matters and and he was an incredible leader really and really great at bringing people together and so in the end decided we would do a high level panel on women's economic empowerment and I think it really enabled us to to drill into that aspect and 
put in place some deeper strategy. And even now, that group that was on the panel, we still work together and mm -hmm. we'll be getting together at Wilton Park for a, a foreign office, foreign Commonwealth Development Office event next week. So I think it continues to play its role in making sure we keep the momentum going on gender equality. Brilliant. And it's fantastic, by the way, to mention FMG. Um, so for those of you online who don't know what that is, that's female genital mutilation, which I think is a still remains a really big issue, particularly in other parts of the world, but actually even in our own country. So um, absolutely, really important to get those. Um, in my time as a, an academic, the language has changed. So we can say FMG and indeed we can say menopause as well, which is um, which is something that certainly five, six, seven years ago, People weren't talking about that in the workforce. So what do you think are the biggest challenges still facing uh, as in realising women's economic empowerment around the world? What, what's the, what should we be fighting for? Where should we be putting our energies? Uh, well, I suppose if you start global, then I think the big challenge coming down the track, in a sense, is, well, let, let's start. I mean, first of all, COVID has been um has been something to widen the gap for women um it's taken women out of education it's often taken women out of um employment so it, it's been a backward step and therefore some of the challenges that we already faced have got more challenging I think coming down the track at the UN system is the fact that we're in 2024 the UN SDGs run to 2030 Mm. And so that will be with us before we know it. But actually, I think we've got to make sure that whatever comes after the SDGs, um, we have as an ambitious uh, approach on gender equality as, as we have within the SDGs. Maybe it should look at areas like digital inclusion and the digital divide, things that I think even back in 2013, 2014, probably weren't as much part of the equation. And I'd finally say, Jane, I think if I think closer to home and I spent time as Minister for Women and Equalities, I introduced the gender pay gap mm. um, back in 2017. I think it's probably time to come back to that economic piece for women, as you were talking about. I think we know a lot more now because of the data that we're getting on gender pay. But my concern is there's a so what question now, isn't there? We know the facts, but yeah. What are we doing uh, to almost redouble our efforts? And I think for the UK now, it is about probably doing gender pay gap 2.0. You know, what comes after that? We know the stats now, but the problem is they're quite steady state. I think it's about that pipeline. Um, you know, women are getting into careers, they're moving up, but actually partly because of things like the menopause and often socioeconomic disadvantage, women aren't always getting to the top. And you see that in terms of leadership um, in many of our businesses, although it's moved in the right direction. And, and I've always had this thing in my mind, certainly looking at politics, that, you know, probably about a third of MPs are female. And you almost have this sense that somehow, for some reason, when you get to about a third, things plateau off. <laughs> and it's almost like the wider still very male driven version of the world says actually this is pretty good third we've done quite well you know, that's enough, yeah. isn't it? job yeah. done and Job's so i think i think whether you look at business and economics or politics or broader society there's this 2.0 question like how do you get from better to gender parity they're not the same mm -hmm. thing and i think we need to collectively think what's that strategy to get to parity rather than just better, which is where we've gone, you know, and that's that's progress over the last few years, but it's not the whole journey, is it? No, so job is not done. Definitely so, not. And, and you know, and it's in, when you look at gender equality for the UK and the gender pay gap, what it's telling us is we now do need to focus on that upper end of careers, which is why mm -hmm. menopause matters, you know. So we, we kind of know the next pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, but I think it's good to see that we're starting to think more strategically about how we are going to actually make some practical progress on that. Yeah, absolutely. And the theme of, of this year's um, International Women's Day is inclusion. 
So I guess broadening out from, from that, now tell us a little bit about how inclusion has influenced your, your career, because it's been there as a theme running through, and particularly the lens of social mobility. Talk yeah, and, and in a sense... About, about that. All the... Um, all the issues around gender equality and, and why it makes social sense for individuals, for communities, why it's um, economically powerful to have women involved, um, why it makes political sense. You know, we reach better decisions when our politics reflects um, our country. Those, those issues all hold true for much broader forms of diversity. And in particular, um, people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds and, and people facing disadvantage. And I think when you I go back to the gender pay gap, when you look at almost, so which are the women that are finding it harder to progress? Often it's ones that maybe have less broader resources that they can draw on when they get to those more challenging periods in their career. Um, it might be those that um, have less ability to get support on caring responsibilities in the case of of women. But but what's behind that is often the background that they come from. And this issue of intersectionality. And I think what we've understood a lot more now is that although we can progress, particularly gender, um, maybe if you're going to go from a third to parity, that's the big the big jump we need. We need to start looking at some of these broader diversity issues and those social mobility issues if we're going to unlock that final tranche of, of the journey on progress towards um, gender parity. And I think that's for me what drives me on social mobility because I think it's that even broader lens on how you can, you know, whatever your gender whatever your background, um, sexuality or ethnicity, whatever, or disability, whatever those barriers that that may end up being in the way, none of them should stop people from fulfilling their potential. And and, and actually, crucially, I think that, that what we've learned on gender equality is so applicable to some of these other areas. So in a sense, it's forged ahead. But actually now the broader legacy of that progress I think we can bring to bear on so many other areas, particularly in business, where actually we slightly demystified how to make sure businesses are uh, places where, where whether you're male or female, you can really progress. And, and I think we can learn from that progress and start applying to the, a much mm -hmm. broader diversity agenda, which is really important. So just thinking about and, uh, and your, your degree was in economics. So making that economic argument, I mean, right at the beginning, when we were talking about gender equality, you said, well, countries aren't going to grow if they're not including half of or half of the women. How do we make that economic argument? If I was to challenge you to make the economic argument for social mobility, which, of course, is what all ministers ultimately, we, we you know, uh, if we want to be arguing for something, we need to make that case. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And and I would argue that sometimes there are these moments that really shift the dial. So if you think about climate, certainly here in the UK, we had a piece of work done by Sir Nicholas Stern. And the reason it got us moving as a nation was because it set out the economic cost of inaction. And I think it put that whole debate then in a really different space. And, and I can think back to the gender equality area where McKinsey did a piece of work on the economic cost of gender um, inequality. And similarly, you know, you can look at um, reports, I think, by the World Bank, for example, by Closer to Home, the Sutton Trust that I'm very involved with, um, at the economic cost of missed potential to economies. And you know, I think the Sutton Trust has calculated at, at literally billions of pounds, tens of billions of pounds. And it makes sense, doesn't it? If, if you've got all this talent going to waste, especially in a century where really economies are powered by talent in this tech AI world that we are now living in, then really, if you're not very good at accessing all of your talent for whatever reason, or that talent can't develop, or it can develop, but it can't connect to opportunity, then you've got a real economic problem. 
as well as a social problem. And we just had our UK budget here um, delivered by the Chancellor today. And one of the big issues he mentioned that's holding the UK economy back is that people are not in work. And for various reasons, they are of working age, but not economically active. And that's holding back our economy. But there's a broader point there, isn't there, Jane, about um, making sure that people who want to get on don't have to uh, have too many barriers that get in the way of them doing that. Great. So I think we've covered quite a lot of ground already. Uh, I'm <laughs> going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, bring our audience in here because um, on my other, I should say to, for the audience at, at home or wherever you're watching this, I've got two screens. I've got Justin in front of me and then I've got the questions popping up on the screen next to, to me. So I'm just going to have a, a little look over here and um and please um you can vote up the questions as well so if you really like a question just vote it up and, and it will get to the top of my list and so the top of my list at the moment is a, a question from Mia Louise Barnett and she says to the Right Honourable Justin Greening as someone who's recently completed work experience in Parliament I'd like to know what advice you have for young women looking to get into politics. And of course, we've seen quite a lot of women actually leaving politics and talking about mm -hmm. the, the toxic environment of, of, of politics. So what advice would you give to someone who wants to get into it? Well, so my advice would definitely be go for it. You know, we're not going to fix this problem by um, the next generation thinking, well, I'm just going to try and influence the system from the outside eventually and the reason I went into politics was I, I thought well it's all very well campaigning but almost some people need to have and be prepared to take on the responsibility for sort of working this all out as a whole and I also think that representing people is really important and and it's hugely valuable especially in in what can feel like quite a polarized version of Britain so so my advice is definitely go for it don't be put off um the, the other advice I'd have would be you know you don't have to have any qualifications to be an MP so have the confidence to be yourself and I, I think I think sometimes you might see people on TV and they look like they know so much about everything and believe you me when I became an MP there were loads of things I've knew virtually nothing about really I just had my own common sense and was campaigning on local issues so I'd, I'd say start local um get to know community groups in your area if that's the one that you'd like to represent and um maybe try and get a bit of mentoring as well from people who are even in local politics you know they will know a huge amount about probably how to approach it reach out to some people who are MPs at the moment and you know maybe get their advice but um but yeah, there's lots you can do, and uh, and maybe maybe um, expect a few a few pitfalls on the way because that's life, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I absolutely. didn't I didn't win the first seat that I uh, that I ran for Parliament in, um, but I think the whole experience was incredible. So I just thought oh, maybe I will have another go at this. Um, um, so yeah, you, keep going. Were you active in uh, when you were a student, Justin? Were you active in? No, in God, no. No, 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 Jane. I, I, I remember heading along to the student union, seeing a really fractious political debate and thought, oh, God, don't want to get involved in that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so being looking at university politics really put me off politics. Um, but in the end, I thought, well, well, maybe if I'm a sensible person, um, I became a local councillor and really enjoyed doing that. Yeah. So it was a classic case of one thing leading to another in a very unplanned way. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Um, so uh, the question from Rebecca, who says, if you could go back and give your 20 year old self one piece of advice, what would that be? Oh, it would it would almost be certainly what, what I just said, which is go for it. Don't be too worried about failing at something, actually. Um, just give things a go and give yourself the space to be successful. And maybe if I'm thinking about because it's such a good question, I might say to myself, take a few more risks. Mind you, I probably took quite a few risks stepping away from career, running for and all of that. 
But I think when I was thinking about what career to do, I was very close minded about saying no to things that I didn't know about. But actually, now that I look back on it, I hardly knew anything about any careers. And I think I wasn't aware of that. So I would say be be open minded about what opportunities can look like and be open minded about the fact that even the ones that seem like they're beyond you probably aren't. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, at the University of Southampton, we have a fantastic career service. So if, if we've got any current students on, um, do pop along and, and find out more about all these fantastic different careers and also reach out to our alum like, like Justin. Justin. So um, oh, another question from this time from someone saying anonymous. Uh, why do you think women generally lack confidence in the workplace compared to men? And what can we do to change this? Well, it's a, a very important, good question. And I hate stereotyping in a way, but <laughs> um, I think I think in my experience, I, I mean, we've all only got our own lived experience, but I just think maybe maybe the men just network very effectively anyway. And, you know, they're often they're not out of work when it comes to starting families in the way that women are and I think one of the important things that's changed recently in say the last decade in particular is I think taking those career breaks doesn't harm your career now in the way that it absolutely did before yeah. and but I also think it's important for us to well effectively stick together if I'm absolutely honest I, I think women need to support one another and I think we need to be prepared to mentor one another. And certainly one of the best things about being in Parliament, to go back to the first question, was female MPs are generally really supportive of one another. And, you know, we certainly had our group within the Conservative Parliamentary Party. There was the Labour one. You know, I've regularly talked to people like Harriet Harman about what I was doing when I was Minister for Women and Equalities. And so I think a lot of it is just be prepared to be supportive and you know, almost be that, if you're in a position of leadership, be that female leader that you would have wanted so earlier on in your pay career. It back. Pay it back. Yeah, definitely. Pay, pay Don't back. assume someone, we can all be leaders, whatever, where, wherever we are. There's always somebody further, you mm -hmm. know, behind their career or in their education than we are. So, so try and open the doors because often, particularly people maybe from, like, I would never have asked for help or mentoring I would have been a bit embarrassed to do that I would have thought it was a bit cheeky so I think offer to people um because sometimes maybe the the people that can really benefit from advice are also going to be the ones that don't really know how to ask for it either yeah that's great in fact we've just put in a reverse mentorship scheme in great the university. Idea. so so some of our students are now mentoring our university executive and I have to say it's it's been it's been fantastic because you learn so much you never mm. stop learning every day is a school day really so <laughs> we, we've got another question coming through and it's about um balancing your career and home life work-life balance and of course uh, we've kind of referred to that a little bit when we've been talking about um mobility and 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 some of the mm. barriers but how have you managed your work-life balance i think at times really badly and and again i think it's i think it's really important to be honest about this um it can be really hard and sometimes you don't get it right and i think there were maybe some years when i didn't get the balance right and so you, you know you can't really beat yourself up about it too much because because you are trying your best i think the key is to know that you need to try and find a balance. I think if you don't even have that in mind, then it is a real problem. But but there'll probably be times when it's easier and, and in which case make the most of that. But there'll also be times when it's really hard and actually just the demands of what you're doing mean you do have to focus on that. And at that point in time, that's probably important. So so do that. Don't feel too guilty. But at the same time, just just make sure that you, you kind of try and keep the plate spinning, as I might put it in my mind, um, and, and work out different ways to do that. And I think generally you don't get anywhere without that wider support ultimately. So so it matters 
for for you as well as for them um but it's tough but like i say i really think it's quite important to be clear that you know you're not always going to be able to get a great balance but you know that's life and so like don't don't worry about it too much um, don't worry about get it. there eventually yeah absolutely and also, I mean, I, you know, I, everyone thinks there are these sort of super women out there that constantly that they don't exist. You know, you read about them in these these magazines, but they don't exist. It's messy. Um, but, you know, I'm sure you'd be fine. And and so don't don't kind of overstress on it too mm-hmm. much is what I would say. Yeah. And draw on your social networks as well. So um, we know the importance of um, intergenerational support going upwards and downwards yeah. and, but also across so um yeah absolutely um oh now we're onto the glass ceiling here how do we stop women in high positions from being seen as though they got there because of gender diversity policies rather than because they are actually very good well i would say i think most of the people who say that are probably blokes so we shouldn't really worry about it too much. Um, you know, I, I think um, you just have to keep on keep on trucking. That's one of my life mottos. Um, you know, there'll always be some people who patronisingly suggest that maybe you've only got that role because of that. Of course, it's not true. Um, it's just correcting a long standing imbalance that probably shouldn't have ever been there in the first place. So, um you know, welcome to the world as it will look, which is far more equal. Um, and actually, people will get women are getting roles on merit. And actually, that's that's the final step for me is to clear those upper hurdles um, to careers so that 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 women can get right to the top, um, because I think that's the next probably the next challenge, certainly in the UK, not globally. I recognise that globally. Um, every country has really different challenges, actually, for for gender equality. But I'd say that's Britain's challenge in a way. Brilliant. So we've got, uh, in fact, we've got some men online, which is absolutely fantastic because, of course, this Brilliant. is inclusion. And, it uh, is, and also, Jane, um, you know, men and boys are a massive part of the solution. Absolutely. And absolutely. can be some of the most, in my experience, some of the most powerful advocates for why this is important and. And I think can be brilliant at pulling through that talent. So, yes, that's that's really fantastic to hear. So, well, we've got a question from Paul, Paul Bennett, and he says 99% of plumbers, builders, mm-hmm. and waste disposal operatives, miners, etc., are men. Why aren't women entering those careers? A well, percentage of men are C-suite. Not quite sure what that last bit means, but what was the last bit? A tiny percentage of men are C-suite. Oh, it's gone off the area. It's gone, disappeared. But he's asking why aren't women becoming miners and plumbers? Yeah, and I well, I think it's I think it part of it is social norms, isn't it? The fact that uh, generally you can be what you can see, and so if we don't see lots of women as plumbers, then um, then we tend to kind of not think it's necessarily something we could do. I'm just thinking because I came across an absolutely brilliant plumbing company that was run by women and full of women plumbers. And it was called something like, I'm going to see if I can Google it somehow. It was called something like Stock Cox. <laughs> it had this, this really brilliant name. But if you wanted a female plumber, you join this business and then you could put in your postcode and find a female plumber near you. So I do think um, you probably do need to have some initiatives like that to just try and open it up for people. Um, So there's a bit about their attitudes. There's a bit about the working environment and making sure that is open to everyone. And, you know, you ask a haulage company about why women aren't driving lorries. Well, you know, there's a whole range of reasons, but one of them is that rest areas are terrible for women um, Mm -hmm. in terms of what we like to see versus probably what men are willing to put up with. And so some of it's practical and some of it's organisational, the kind of culture. um, Do we need to do more? Do we need to do more in schools as well? I mean, you and I sat sat next to each other actually on, on the graduation platform and we saw certain disciplines were all um, 
uh, young men coming across the platform. Certain disciplines were, were fantastic young women and some were actually very gender mixed. But um, how do we kind of shift that? It seems that we, we sort of almost at school and then into university, if, if you're coming to university, we, we definitely know that some of our disciplines are, are more one gender than the other. How do we unpack that a bit? I think it's about getting a lot of employers um, just more used to working upstream, um, mm. even in primary schools as well as secondary schools, talking about careers and then and then doing that, though, in a way that showcases the women doing those careers as well as perhaps men, especially when it's a, a sector where maybe, you know, you just talked about plumbing, where maybe it's been more traditionally male dominated. Um, so I think you have to work. Uh, right upstream but I also think you know we've seen progress particularly in the professions you know there was a time when many accountants would have been you know more likely to be men and actually it's been 50 50 for some time similarly um, in law so we know we can do this and it's just a question of um, I think a broader social mobility push on helping all of our children look at different careers and and get a sense of what their choices are a, a bit more effectively than we've been able to do up till now and I think that's partly because we haven't had as many employers in schools talking about careers and you know maybe their best place to really bring it alive. Right there was a fantastic question up on on um, from a colleague called Martin Dyke who's uh, uh, in our school of education actually and he said if there was a Labour government at the mm-hmm. next election and they asked you to, to come in and be um, the, the Minister for Gender Equality and Diversity, what would you say? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think my first thing I'd say is, well, it's going to be a bit hard because I'm not an MP, actually. <laughs> so they'd have to, have to find a way uh, to, to somehow get me in Parliament. But I think most of my, well, my social mobility work is all cross-party. Yeah. And so we do actually work with the Labour Party and all of that. And I think one of the things I've really been encouraged by is to see the opposition engage much more strategically on social mobility. You know, and I've said to them, I would do gender pay gap 2.0 if I was in government. So we've probably got an election coming up um, later on this year. So we'll see We'll see what happens. I mean, mm. at the moment, the polls suggest we'll have changed government. And then, yeah, we may well get to see what Labour will do on the equalities brief. I think there'll be quite a lot with employers, um, but I also feel like it needs a bit more leadership and, in a sense, a, a fresh push and impetus to give it some yeah. fresh momentum. Brilliant. Um, OK, this one's been upvoted. Were you inspired by any strong public women when you were a student? And if so, how did they inspire you? I would say less as a student, more as a, you know, child, you know, kiddie wink. Um, so I grew up in the 80s and I used to joke that we didn't have any male role models because <laughs> we had uh, Margaret Thatcher running the country for that whole decade. Um, we had a queen on the throne. Um, we had some really, you know, big personalities in a sense. There was Princess Diana, who was, I mean, utterly shaped the fashion scene of Britain um, in lots of ways. You know, she was always in the paper. There were these really ballsy, as if I can put it like that, um, business women like Rosemary um Conran and um, uh, people like that. I mean, it was uh, oh god, the lady who did the body body shop. Um, Anita Roderick. Anita Roderick. They Roderick. they were all over the place. These these quite you know just get going go getting women um, taking decisions. And I I think that really inspired me actually because I just remember thinking when John Major came in, I remember thinking, ooh interesting a man you know in a senior position so I just think that for my generation weirdly I think we always grew up feeling like we could do something I think the big challenge was the pipeline wasn't really being built so almost maybe there was a complacency that because those people had been in those sorts of roles and visible that everything else was going to get fixed and it absolutely wasn't the case and I think what happened was we lost momentum 
probably during the 90s. And therefore, that's why during those early noughties, you then had to start thinking, well, how are we going to pick up pick up momentum again, actually? Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, really interesting observation. Um, another kind of question, um, this, uh, taking us global now, uh, which countries have made more progress than others and why? Hmm. Do we understand that and can, can we then apply that to uh, more widely? Well, I think, and I, I think this is still true now, um, but apologies if, if it's not. But certainly when I was working in development, you could look at a country like Ethiopia and it actually had made quite significant progress on combating FGM. And it did that through quite a, a multi-layered approach, working particularly with local community leaders to change attitudes and expectations and and so I think there are some some areas where you can really point to times when when countries have really been able to make some progress on on certain areas I think I think the UK work on the gender pay gap I mean I introduced it but we had cross-party support for that um, in parliament so I think that was for us a really good step forward um, that others could learn from. Um, I would say that, you know, obviously Scandinavian countries probably have really been ahead of the curve on um, shared parental leave and, if you like, that workplace perspective of gender equality. So, in a sense, the, the inspiring thing for me is the answers are out there, Jane. It's just finding them, learning from them, mm -hmm. and then spreading that best practice as much as we can. And probably if we're thinking about where we go with the SDGs, you know, really it's now that we should almost be kicking off a process over the next two, three years of finding that best practice and getting that status report of who's surged balls on where and what we can learn. That should then perhaps inform that more strategic international discussion on what a fresh version of a, a gender equality goal in a, a fresh version of the SDGs, if we can get them. Um, should look like. Yeah, that's very interesting. So the, the, it, there's no one answer, of course, because there's so many different dimensions to this. But um, and actually, if you look at, I mean, China, you know, is quite an interesting example on gender. Mm. Um, you know, for all of the broader challenges around human rights, um, you know, has probably worked hard on gender equality. So it's interesting. So, so, so in a sense, you have to look for the evidence, and it's not always where you necessarily. It's all over the place, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And we should, we should be, we should get it wherever it is. Okay, that's great. Um, what changes would you like to see or hope for in the next ten years? So, um, you've talked about gender pay gap and two point zero. What else? If you think, if you could write two or three policies, what would your dream policies be? Well, setting aside how important it is to get a successor to the SDGs that includes gender, but I'm 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 having that as a freebie chain. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. what needs to be in it um, is just that continued articulation around education. Yeah. Because that is at the heart of women being able to make progress it's at the heart of changing men's attitudes towards women in many parts mm. of the world from them being or us being an asset to you know to, to us really being able to contribute much more um economically um so education followed by a broadening out of um opportunities to women and entrepreneurship um and then i think finally there's probably a real need to continue to to look at some of these cultural norms, whether it's around FGM, whether it's around child marriage, which, mm -hmm. you know, still happens in many parts of the world and is often a reason why both of those things are often a reason why girls and girls drop out of education. So I think it's this transition from girlhood into adulthood that I think I would be really focusing in on now. I think what we've been able to do through the MDGs and SDGs is, is 
I think focus much more at scale on education. I think it's that next piece of it now that really I would have us focus on now and that transition mm -hmm. where the risks are. OK, so from girlhood, childhood into that to adulthood. Mm -hmm. And should the, given that, should the international community be doing more on Afghanistan? I mean, what, one of the things I think I was most proud of at, at the University of Southampton is that um, during that summer, we actually um, played our role and, and we were hosting a number of female academics who managed to, to, to leave Kabul. They were, one was a, a lecturer in politics, a female lecturer in politics at the University of Kabul. So, of course, yeah, um, you know, she wasn't safe and she managed to come out and we, uh, we're very proud that we're hosting her. But it seems that that's kind of gone off the, the radar that we're not paying so much attention, but yet those girls have not gone back to school. I think some of the most amazing people that I met in my entire time as Development Secretary were women in Afghanistan who were campaigning and politicians and women who'd gone into the police mm. and genuinely stepped up to change things, to literally be that person that a next generation of girls in Afghanistan could look at and say, well, I, I can be a police officer because she's doing it. I can be a lecturer, I can be a member of parliament. And I think it's an absolute tragedy that we've seen things move so quickly, so far backward in a country where we really had made progress on, on gender equality, albeit from a low base. We really had been part of helping to change it for the better for women. And I find it absolutely heartbreaking whenever I see the state of Afghanistan now. I, I think I think maybe it's symptomatic of a, of a of a sort of UN in the sense that still thinks often into a male dominated way that this hasn't been at the top of the agenda in the way that it, it probably should be. I, th I think the biggest tragedy is the fact that we had made progress mm. and that so many women across that country had embraced it. Mm -hmm. And to have to go back now, I think, is, is obviously heartbreaking for them. Um, yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna finish on a positive note. Sorry to have turned it into no, uh, no, no. But these that's the reality. Is, is, uh, it, as it, we're talking difficult. about International Women's um, Day coming up on Friday. Um, so just turning back to the positive, what are you most hopeful about in terms of women's equality in the near future, and what are you most fearful of? Mm. So you can choose actually whether you end on hope or fear. Or both. OK, so uh, we've already talked about the fears anyway. I'm worried that we'll get to the end of the SDG period and because the world can't really agree about anything at the moment, that it would be really hard to do an ambitious gender goal like we had last time. So that's my worry. But I think meantime, outside of politicians not being able to agree, which is a perennial problem on virtually everything from what I can make out at the moment, Meantime, the good news is we don't have to rely on politicians to make progress on gender equality. Actually, that's down to all of us. We can be mentors. We can be in businesses and employer organisations that are more open to more women. We can we can be part of making sure that if our business has got gender gaps that aren't closing, that we are people who push to um, push to get that change. We can we can be people that support those brilliant um, civil society groups that are out there on the ground in places like Afghanistan, still trying to shift things in the right direction. And we can be all voices for progress. We can be a voice to say, well, I'd like to see this move forward, actually. And we're going to have an election in Britain, be a voice to say, what are we going to see from any of these people who want to represent us on gender equality. So in spite of everything, actually, this is a really practical agenda. And therefore, there's a ton that we can do to move things forward, irrespective of what's going on in and around the rest of our, what feels occasionally crazy world that we live in. 
Justin, thank you so much <laughs> for, for, for joining us this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you and, and sharing those insights. And, and ultimately, it's all of our responsibility is, is basically what you're saying is that yeah. um, to move us forward, it's, it's everybody. It's a pleasure to hear from our past students. It's a pleasure to hear about all the fantastic things you've been doing. Great questions um, as well. Uh, yeah, I wanted to thank the audience. Thank you so much, audience, for joining us tonight. It's been great to have so many of you with us. In a moment, for the audience, not for Justin and I, you'll see a short poll uh, pop up on your screen and we'll be asking you to kindly complete this. And I'm told it will take you no more than two minutes of your time. So please do that because it's really helpful for us to get feedback. And we'll be sharing footage from tonight's event over the coming days. Uh, so keep an eye on your inbox and details how to access this. And thank you all again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.